Welcome back to Low Buck Garage. I'm going to give you a quick overview of this episode. I make a lot of mistakes, I spend money I didn't have to, and I'm really happy about it. So if you got time, why don't you come along and see what happened. Last time you saw that bike, I had pieced it together and got it kind of running and drove it, but uh, it's not right. And I was left with the question, do I just get rid of it as is and make a few bucks or do I fix it up? Almost all of you said fix it up and the timing worked out perfectly because it just so happened I found a new home for a finished project. I had a little bit of funds to work with, so I just poured a bucket of money on this thing. Now let's start throwing these parts at it and see if we can get it running right. Now the biggest problem I face with the carburetor, and on these bikes, a known upgrade for the street version is to use the off-road only style carburetor. So I got one here. It cost me, ooh, $224. Uh, this is the TM33. It is a pumper style carb, and from what the internet wisdom is, the little accelerator pump that actually gives it a shot of fuel makes the motor a lot more responsive than the stock carb ever is. I don't know, we'll find out, but uh, we're going to install it. Last video I did on this bike, I made a big mistake. Now the problem here is I didn't actually talk to the person that had worked on the bike last. Uh, I got a bike with this carburetor and this manifold and this spacer. So I took this manifold and I bored it out to fit the carburetor. Working, which worked fine with this carburetor. Now I want to upgrade to this carburetor. This is about 1.65. This one is 1.57 ish. So that means there's almost a hundred thousand difference between the two, which is almost exactly what I cut out of this manifold. So this manifold would have fit this carburetor had I not modified it. And the other thing I found out when looking at the kits to convert to this carburetor, they come with a spacer, like this one. So basically what I didn't know about is someone before me decided to ditch this carburetor, collected the pieces to add this carburetor, but didn't have this one. So I went and took these pieces and made them fit this one, now they don't fit this one anymore. So basically I completely ruined the stuff I needed to install the carburetor I wanted to use. So I was not happy about that. I was not having fun, which meant I was doing it wrong. So I had to think about what my goal is here. And obviously I want this carburetor around there, but I also want to learn something because I always like to learn stuff, uh, particularly if it's something that can help someone else out. So I decided to turn this into a learning moment. First off, research before you start cutting. Yeah, that's probably a no brainer. But then, say you're trying to do the carb swap to this one to this one, and don't have this one available. What are your options? First thing I did was buy the factory manifold for this bike, because that was the one I could find from Suzuki. Uh, this fits this carburetor. It is too big for this one. Uh, it's rubber, you could probably squish it down. Then you notice I'm not taking it out of the package because I don't want to actually use this one. This thing was like 40 bucks. I want to return it and uh, get my money back on that one because that's pricey. There's better options out there. I started scrolling through eBay, searching by lowest price first, and I came up with more manifolds. Um, there's a lot of options out there because it's just a round pattern with the hole on either side. Lots of things use that. This is a universal 32, 34 millimeter carb uh, manifold, and this one's a 33 millimeter carb, so I figured it would fit. Now the bolt holes are a little bit too close together. Let me use my spacer. You can see that one's a little wider, but I could just cut the ends off here, make it turn them into slots, and that would bolt right on no problem. And I could stack my spacer in there, and this would work. This manifold was $8.99, way better than the almost 40 bucks. You still need a spacer, and the hole spacing wasn't quite right. So I kept scrolling. 
This is a manifold for a Yamaha Kodiak Grizzly Wolverine 400-450 bike. This was $9.53. And notice how it's longer. That will take the room of the spacer and actually even move the uh, carburetor out a little further. And that'll give me plenty of clearance for the electric starter. The best part of all, fits perfect. Hole spacing's right. This thing is a straight bolt-on and it was about a quarter of the price as a Suzuki part. We're gonna do a little comparison here. This is the manifold that came in the bike that I ruined. Now see that is, right there is where it hits the starter, and that's the problem that people add the spacer for. Now with the spacer, this would fit. Now this is that generic Kipo manifold I found. Now that is probably the same problem if you just bolt it straight on. Yep, hits the starter. Add the spacer. Have the spacer there. And we do have clearance on that bottom screw. It's a little tighter than the stock one, but it doesn't touch, so that would work. Now this is the Yamaha manifold. And uh, you can see it's actually almost too long here. Uh, pushes the screw up, got plenty of room down there. Also kicks it at a slight angle, but um, it gives me a lot of room and it looks like it works. So I'm gonna try bolting this one in. Now if this does work, this means you don't need to buy a spacer. You can just buy the $10 manifold, cheaper than the Suzuki one, and uh, you're done with the whole thing. So we're gonna try this out. And this is that manifold installed. Let me go around a little bit so you can see it better. This is a little bit better view. Uh, I did have to rotate this wiring harness. I just pushed it around because it was hitting the, the top of the screw there. So I'm gonna to have to keep an eye on that. Maybe re-zip tie it again. This carburetor definitely moves that way with this manifold. So I don't know if that's good or bad, but that's what it is. But it looks like it clears everything right now. I'm gonna hook up my throttle cables, then figure out the connection to the air box. Here we have the throttle. It goes this way. Let's see if these cables work. Here's a good shot of my hand blocking your view. But, yeah, that's the pull cable. So, yeah, we're already winning. Now I've been adjusting this pull cable a little bit. Right now I'm at the idle stop. It doesn't give me full throttle. There's still some to go. It's got it most of the way, but not full. So uh, we gotta do something about these cables. This is enough to drive it for now, but we don't have full power, so obviously that's a problem. Now I'm gonna set the valve clearance in this motor. Uh, a number of you mentioned that in the comments. I didn't do it before. Also, that king quad I had wouldn't start because the valves are too tight. So I know for sure I've got to do that. And since I had the tank off anyway, it's a perfect time. Now I have the official instruction page. I'm gonna see if I can mostly follow this. The first thing I'm doing is popping off these two covers, and that way you can get it to top dead center. So I really wallowed this one out. Oh, luckily they didn't tighten it too badly. Whoa, oil everywhere. Apparently I'm gonna be changing the oil next because uh, this looks pretty nasty actually. Okay, so I turn this nut until inside there, there's a little line with a T for top dead center. I'm not really feeling anything. Let me try the exhaust ones. Yeah, exhaust ones definitely move. All right, let's check out the feeler gauge. The intake valve is supposed to be two to four thou. I could kind of get the two thou started, but it's definitely on the tight side. I only went a quarter turn on this. There wasn't a whole lot. I got this set up as a go, no go. So this right here is the two thou for the small end, and it fits and moves freely. The four thou I can kind of shove under there, but then it gets stuck. So it's probably about three thou. So that one's good. I got to do the other intake, then we'll check the exhaust all the same manner. Now I got to talk about the oil. In my last video, I checked the oil when I first had it. There was nothing on the stick, and that's where I left it on the video. Because I very quickly realized I have no idea how to check the oil on these, and um, I didn't want to tell you the wrong information, at least not intentionally. The problem you run into is the dry sump system. So you've got the pump in the motor, it pumps oil out of the tank, through the motor, and back into the tank. Now this bike had sat for a long time when I got it. And when it's sitting in the tank there, the only thing keeping it from draining back is I think the oil pump. It has to flow through the oil pump on its own. And if it sits for a long time, even with a fairly tight oil pump, it would drain down. Now, I wasn't sure whether anyone had oil at all in there, and since it wasn't on the stick, I went in and added more oil. And then, 
after I drove it, it ended up being over full. Now it's sat for a couple weeks and says it's perfect. After I ran it, it was like way up here. Before I ran it, it was way off there. And then looking up on various forums, there's not a really good consensus on how you're supposed to check this oil because of the whole drain back issue. So this one went from under full, ran it, it was over full, let it sit, it's just right. I have no idea. When I pulled off that cap to get to the flywheel to turn it over, oil poured out. I don't think that's supposed to be that high. So I'm thinking it's over full. I really don't know. So I'm gonna go by the volume method, which is we have a number right on the side of the frame telling you how much oil it's supposed to have. I'm gonna drain everything out, put in that amount of oil, call it good. That should be fine. Man, this is pretty black oil, so definitely glad I'm changing it. Now I'm gonna go ahead and pop this skid plate off because I was looking up the information on how to drain this and I found out under here, there's a pickup screen. Very few people actually clean pickup screens. Let's see how hard it is to get to this one. Looks easy enough. Oh yeah, whoa, there's oil everywhere. There we go. It's generally pretty clean, a lot of old oil on it, but we'll clean it off and now we know we have good pickup. The screen is clean, hoses back on, onto the final drain plug. It's actually kind of surprising how complicated it is to change oil in one of these things. I still got a filter to go. All right, let this go for a while. Last drain plug back in. Now it is time to do the oil filter. All right, well, that drains a little bit. Just a little bit sparkly. I'm sure that's fine. Interestingly, these Suzuki filters do not come with the O-rings. Um, the manual says to replace the O-rings, but I don't have any, so I'm not. I'm just reusing them. New filters installed, so let's button this up. I'm sure it only leaked a little bit. It'll probably be fine. O-rings really last a long time. Now looking in the shop manual, they say it's 1.7 liters for just the oil, 1.9, which is two quarts exactly, for the oil and filter, and 2.1 liters uh, for a complete rebuild. So I did the oil filter, works out to two quarts, which is perfect, because oil comes in quarts. Should even be enough, to, easy enough to count. Two quarts in, let's see what we got. Now this shows way, 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 it's all the way up here, it's way over full. But I kind of expected that, because we haven't pumped any through the motor yet. So uh, we're just gonna pop this in here, and we know we have oil in there, so it'll be fine. My old sparkler was missing a gasket. I went ahead and popped for a new one with a gasket. The only thing is, it's a different style. This is a regular ground strap. This one has two ground straps. But it looks like it fits in the hole the same, so I don't think it'll be a problem. Oh, I just saw a problem. Okay, can't use this one. This one has a full-size connector for the wire. This one does not. And this one fits, which means this one won't and doesn't even have the kind you could screw off. So, I am not doing well on ordering stuff here. Old plug goes back in. Well, I got all this clearance. I'm gonna address the rear brake issue. Um, there weren't any. The reservoir is completely dry. So, uh, I'm just going to add fluid and see what happens. It feels like I'm starting to get a little bit of a pedal. There's definitely something there. Now, I'm sure there's some kind of leak. This area covered in tape and zip tied on might be a leaking potential. See, oh, there's fluid coming out. That's a good sign. There we go, there's the air. All right, that looks right. I think we're good. Fluid seeping out of the electrical tape here. Probably will need to do something about this line at some point. Now the end of this brake lever is broken off which normally doesn't bother me a whole lot because I usually just use the first couple fingers anyway. But uh, I needed to make a minimum in order to get free shipping, so I got a new brake lever. Attached to something. Oh, there's a spring in there. Interesting. There we go. This goes here. There's a little adjusting screw that actually does the work with the master cylinder. I just stole that out of the old one. I think I'm all ready to give this a start, so I gotta install the gas tank. One thing I wanted to show you because this gas tank is so big, it has a big dip in the middle. There's actually a fuel outlet 
on both sides. Previously, I only hooked up one, opened that, and it worked fine. But I'm thinking in order to get to the gas on the other side, you need to open both of them. Uh, so I'm going to put a T in the line, T the two together, and run them into the one carburetor line. Bolt that down first. Find somewhere cool to run the line. It looks like it has to go right on top of the exhaust. That'll be nice and cool. Here's the outlet on the right hand side going directly into the exhaust area. Uh, I think we're just going to run it up and over top of the manifold and hopefully that gets the job done. And I think I can zip tie this to the throttle bracket and keep it out of the way. I think I have this all set up. So I've got both lines from this side and the one from the other side teeing off going to a little filter. Uh, it's a Wix 33007 if anyone likes that style and then to the car. I gotta zip tie this up out of the way and off the head and things like that, but right now I wanna see if any of this works and uh, then I can go from there. Another thing I got is a battery. Now, I found these pretty cheap, but uh, I went for one that was a little bit more expensive. For around 30 bucks, I bought this one for one reason. This one's got a built-in voltmeter and uh, apparently it does other stuff too. There's a whole page on how it diagnoses itself and uh, you can tell what your battery condition is. That means I don't even have to hook the voltmeter to it. I can see if it's charging right on the battery, I think. Uh, we're gonna throw it in and see how it works. Got my new battery in. Uh, while I'm doing that, I figure rather than installing my old bailing wire tie down, I'll go ahead and make one out of a piece of old stainless steel. I need a bend right here going that way, so I have to fold this up. Um, can't actually fit it and get it near the jaws. So uh, probably should have planned that out better and done this bend first and those later. Live and learn. Go with an alternate here. That'll work. Close enough. Now I've got instructions for this battery that don't really help a whole lot, but uh, it sounds like it needs to be activated before it starts measuring anything. Sounds like you might just start it up and that activates it. I don't know, but let's try it. I'm gonna leave the camera on this display while I turn on the ignition. All right, ignition is on. I don't see anything. So I don't know if that helps. I'm gonna try hitting the starter button. Still nothing, so I don't know what to do here. Uh, I'm gonna read you what it says though. Some can't be activated due to the different performance of different vehicle. Start the engine for more times or step on gas, which can more easily to activate. I don't know. I'll just ignore it and use it like a regular battery for now. Maybe it'll turn on at some point. Just threw some gas in here, and while I was doing it, the uh, battery activated. I have 12.62 volt. And uh, when it activated, it popped up a beep and said day zero. So it actually keeps the count of days that you've used the battery, I guess for warranty purposes or something. Anyway, it's working so I can see how many volts I have. And I have gas in the tank. So let's see if it goes into the carburetor. What do we have? Nothing. Why? Why is there no fuel? I know I just put two gallons in this tank. Let's try the valve on the other side. All right. Apparently the function of this valve is to make fuel fall directly on the exhaust pipe. Because that's what happened when I opened the valve. Let's hope this seals up when I turn it off. All right. I don't see any leaking anymore. So we're going to leave that one off for now. Well, looks like fuel is slowly very slowly making its way in. The fuel filter looks pretty full. I'm gonna assume that means we have gas in the carburetor. So, uh, let's try starting it. See what happens. Absolutely nothing. 
Told you. Since this carburetor has an accelerator pump, I'm going to try twisting the throttle and see if I can see fuel going into it. Right in that little brass tube, the squirt goes in. Let's see if we can see it. Let's try this again. I gotta take care of that air box. Because right now that knobby is gonna throw dirt directly into that intake and I don't want that. These are two different sizes. That one's much bigger. I got the new intake tube so I actually had uh, no extra holes in it. This intake tube is for this carburetor. They didn't have the one available for the dirt model for this carburetor. So I'm gonna need to make a spacer between here and there. Now I did find an old piece of radiator hose. I cut the end off because this actually fits the uh, intake on the carburetor pretty well. Now, this one is too big, because this is for the stock style car. So I'm going to try to figure out some way to combine them. Now that new manifold pushed the carburetor backwards, so this by itself is already too long. Adding an adapter to it, obviously is not gonna fly. I really need this adapter to be back here somewhere. I should probably get rid of all that old uh, corrosion from a radiator before I do this. Scotch pad should work fine. Oh yeah, it's coming right off. Perfect. Cut a piece of rubber about this thick, and I'm going to shove it right in this tube. Definitely not returning this part now. They said they take back the other ones though, so that's good. It's shorter. Let's see if it fits. All right, let's see if we can stuff this thing in there. Just gonna put my head in the way of the camera here, sorry. Maybe if I put this ring on first, then let's see what happens. Take a little more trimmings in order here. This isn't gonna work yet. I've been fiddling with this intake tube for an easy hour, and I came up with a solution that I can't call good, but I think it'll work. So let me show you. Because the manifold kicked the carb at a bit of an angle, this intake tube had to be rotated to move this down a bit. So I cut it right about the center line of the frame rail, and that's a piece of radiator tube going to the carb. The radiator tube's actually cut in an angle so it doesn't go square into the carb. The hose clamp is uh, squishing it all in place, but that was a real pain to get in there. And that slid inside, probably a half inch inside this one. Uh, right now it's a slip fit. Um, it's actually fairly tight rubber to rubber seal. I'm going to glue it if this works well. There's a lot of trial in there, a lot of trimming, and uh, it's not the best solution in the world. It does seem to make a seal between the air filter and the carb, and that's all I really care about. So, that means I'm gonna zip tie a few things together here, and we might be able to try this out. Forgot to order the clamp for this front brake line, but uh, I think this will be fine. I think that'll do. Now I've run it for a little bit, I'm gonna give a shot at checking the oil. Let's see what we have. Right about the middle of the stick. Moment of truth here. Now when I was running this, it would run great for a while, then act like it was starving for fuel. And uh, then I let it sit, and it would uh, run great again, until it ran for a little while. So it felt like the fuel bowl was just draining, like it wasn't supplying enough fuel. And uh, that fuel filter took a long time to fill up when I first opened it. So I'm suspicious of this system here. I got it disconnected completely. I got my funnel right here. And uh, let me open up the valve. Look, it's dripping. Let's compare this. Here's the fuel flow going to the carburetor, and here's the fuel flow going directly onto the exhaust. I think I may need to fix that. If nothing else, I want more fuel going in the carburetor than the exhaust, because it seems like this is just wrong. Seeing this fuel issue is making me think that I made another mistake in my previous video. When I saw a carburetor that had a known issue, 
I bought the bike, being told the carburetor is an issue, and I knew this general type of bike, there was a better car. I jumped to the conclusion, the car was the problem. I wonder if the fuel supply was my real problem. I never checked it. And I wonder if the fuel supply was the problem for the last guy that worked on this, who seemed to be working on a carb problem. Maybe this was the problem all along for both of us. So I'm thinking there's a very real possibility I didn't actually need to buy that carburetor. Now I learned another new thing. This is a good way to make lessons memorable. Spending money on something you didn't actually need by misdiagnosing it, I would remember that one. That's flowing good now. I got both my fuel valves out of the tank. It's time to see what's wrong with them. When I first got the bike and initially put it together, I looked in the tank. Everything looked fine. It looked spotless. Uh, there was no crud buildup. These filters are well, clean as a whistle. Um, so I didn't even give it a second thought. And when I opened a valve and the carb did fill with fuel, didn't even think about it. I just decided they were fine. But this might be our major problem. So now we're going to tear them apart and figure out what went wrong. All right, we've got a plate here, which guides which way the fuel goes. A couple holes, basically looks like it can connect one to the other, and then uh, that picks which intake you have. Now one thing I'm looking at, let's take a look down at the end there. Let me try a little more light. I don't know if you can see that. That's completely clogged. Never noticed that before. Yep, totally plugged with stuff. I'm not even sure what that is exactly. So this whole valve was almost completely plugged. Air comes through the pickup fine. So it was after the valve to the outlet that it was clogged. Usually when you have this kind of uh, double redundant system, one of them will work. But I'm looking, I see some debris in the other one. So let's take this one apart and see what we got here. Yep, same thing. We go, this is the outlet hole down here, and uh, completely full of something. I'm not really sure what this debris is. Um, I'm thinking it might be those mud wasp dirt daubers. With just gravity feed fuel, I've never had that actually go through one of those mud wasp nests. So I'm not sure what that is, but um, definitely was a problem. On this front tire, there's a big crack right in the sidewall. I went ahead and popped for a new tire because there's no spare tire on a motorcycle and losing a front tire wouldn't be fun anyway. I pulled out the speedometer cable just so I don't have to deal with that. There we are. You can always check your tension on your spokes the musical way. Oh, that was a nice high one. They seemed all of tension. Different amounts, but no real loose ones. There we go. Got a new tire here. I uh, went with a Kenda Parker DT because first off it was pretty cheap. And uh, secondly, it's a desert tire where basically it's a six ply tire and it's really tough. Even though it doesn't grip as well as a lot of other tires, uh, it's one of the more durable ones out there. And I always wanna make sure I get home. That's more important than performance. Interesting thing about it is uh, it's directional but it's both directions. Check this out. It has arrows on it for both directions. Install it with this direction going, it's meant for hard terrain. If you install it that direction going, it's meant for intermediate terrain. Which is kind of interesting, just the direction of the rotation changes the traction profile. From what I understand, intermediate is best all around, uh, so I'm gonna go that way. I found these uh, little rim locks interesting. These go inside the tire, they actually bolt through the rim, and squish the tire onto the rim so it can't come off. Um, they're two different sizes. These are both on there. One is a 1.85, one is a 1.6. But uh, they worked before, so I assume they'll work again, even being different sizes. I caused another problem. Uh, I was trying to install these rim locks and I broke it. So uh, I don't have another one, I'm just going to ignore it. Uh, the problem I run into is there's holes in the rims already. I put some stove bolts right in the hole. That has a nice smooth head so it shouldn't hurt the tube and it'll keep the tube from poking out. And I'm just gonna proceed as though it never had rim locks because that should be fine. Quite honestly, this tire is a little bit of a pain. Uh, I heard from the reviews that the six ply construction, it was pretty stiff. 
and a little difficult to mount. I wrestled with this for a while, but it's on there. It's holding air. Now it's time to uh, button this up and uh, move on to the next fix. It even spins free. Looks mostly straight. I need some extension wire. I go through my pile of scavenged wiring harnesses and uh, sure I got the right color in here somewhere. Found three wires that are about the right color, close enough, and uh, gonna splice them in. Still in that same box of soldered seal connectors I bought a long time ago. I've been really happy with them and there's a lot of them in there to do a lot of jobs. There we go. On the other end, I already slid over some heat shrink tubing. Gotta remember that first. Now I'm gonna connect these and slide that over and seal up the whole thing. Now I've got these ready to go, but I don't wanna get tons of heat on my fender, my seat, or this heat shrink tubing. So I found a uh, beer scented heat deflector and hopefully that does it. I can feel the heat blowing back in my face, so this really is working. All right, got those done. I did shrink up this tube a little bit, but it looks like it'll still move, so I might be okay. Oh, melted into my seat a little bit. Oh well, not like that seat was pristine anyway. Would have been a smart move to check if the signal lights worked before I did that. Let's check them now. Ah, good. Yep, both sides. Excellent. Now that these valves are clean, let's turn it on and see what happens. That looks a lot better. Previously, I only tested this around the yard. I only used first gear. Today was the first time I tried to shift into second, and it didn't go. And quite honestly, I was really disappointed when I was trying to figure out my ending for my complete failure video of a bike with only one gear. But I have to look at the problem and figure out what's wrong. So I looked. Here's the shift lever. Down is first, up is second. See that mark on the case? I think the shift lever's bent, it's running into that case, and that's why we don't have second gear. I've rolled the bike back into the shop so I can take a crack at that shift lever and see if I can bend it to fix it. But before I did that, I bought one more thing. A license plate. And I took a little bit of a gamble on this one, because they gave me the option of registering for one or two years. I said two years because um, I'm hoping this bike gets out of first gear. But I have a trick up my sleeve. Now from what I understand, the YouTube algorithm looks at likes and subscriptions, and when you have more, good things happen. So I can only take that to mean that if a lot of people like and subscribe to this video, I'm going to uh, have all my gears. So if you could do that, I'd appreciate it. In the meantime, I'm gonna take off this shift lever, and hopefully it all works out. All right, let's just twist you this way. Yeah, a little more. Hmm. Maybe. Put in a little bit more of a zigzag. Let's see how that goes. Yeah, that might do it. One other problem I ran into was this gas cap would leak. Now, it was missing the hose originally, and so I figured that was a problem. I put this on before that last ride, but uh, it's still leaking. So, looking in here, it doesn't appear to be any kind of gasket. So I'm gonna put one in. Got some fairly thick cork gasket material and I found a piece of pipe lying on the floor 
it looks like it's just about the right size for the inside of that cap. There we go. Got a nice circle. This cap has a little piece that sticks out in the center. Found a socket that's just a little bit smaller than that. Let's see if a socket will cut through gasket. Perfect. Made a nice little hole. There we go. Fits in pretty nice. Got a gasket now. I'm looking into this throttle cable issue to get that last little bit of throttle. It looks like this side hits and that's what stops the throttle from moving. You can see there's a little cast section that it looks like they've been hitting. I did check the other throttle grip I got with the bike. It doesn't look significantly different. So I don't know if this grip would fix it. So just so I don't have to pull the rubber piece off, I'm going to modify this one. I'm going to trim away those stops a little bit so I get a little more twist. I trimmed off around an eighth inch. Let's see if that does it. It's real close now. I could probably get that last little bit by cutting off the other side of the stop so there's more overall travel and uh, then just adjusting the cables. But that'd be easiest with the tank off and I don't feel like taking the tank off. I want to go riding. And they're so close to full throttle, it'll be fine. Um, next time I have it apart, I'll get a little more. So let's try this thing out. We gotta do a quick test and see if my experiment worked. Do good things happen when people like and subscribe. Let's see if we got second gear. Maybe third. Fourth? Might have all of them. Let's find out. We're gonna try second. Yep, second works. Not enough room in this yard. First gear. Second gear. Third gear. Four, ten, six. We got them all. And thank you guys for all your help. I love having gears. That's it for this episode. Because of all my failures, I'm calling this a complete success. Because I never would have bought the better carb if I got the old one working. This thing's pretty peppy. It's got good throttle response. It jumps as soon as you hit the gas. I'm real happy with the way it works. It's a great little play bike for the trails. And I can drive here by the street, all my camera stuff in the bag, and uh, just go out and play. There are a few little odds and ends. Like I got a new brake line on order. For now, I'm just watching the fluid and it's going down slow but I'll just add some as I need it and put the new one on when I get it. Um, 
probably do a new rear tire too, and uh, a few little things like that. The hydraulic fluid in the shock is perfectly fine for trail use. When it leaks out, I might actually fix it right or just refill it. We'll see. But uh, overall, I'm real happy with this. Now, including my original purchase price, I'm into this over $1,000. But bikes like this are going for double that or more around here. So I'm just going to call that an investment that I get to play with. So now I'm off to have a lot more fun. I hope you guys are having fun too, and we'll see you next time.